At what point during your investigation of the Me Too movement did you know you were on to something? Uh, very early. I mean, did you know you were onto something and the framing of that around a movement is, is perhaps not the way that I would describe either the assignment or the experience of, of the stories you're talking about. I, I did do a number of stories on sexual violence that you know, I was very fulfilled to see, uh, resonated and were then part of a, a, an international conversation about both the issue itself and, and how to cover the issue. And it was gratifying to see that become a template for more kind of confrontational reporting on that issue, less uh, aversion to that issue. Uh, you know, I mean, I remember having conversations when I was first reporting in that space to the effect of just, you know, being told, you, you just can't cover that issue. That's a he said, she said issue, and it always will be. And I was so confused by it because I didn't understand why that should be siloed off in a way that was distinct from any other kind of criminal reporting. You know, it's, it's like any other crime where, yes, uh, it can be fraught with many obstacles, there can be a lack of eyewitnesses, some portions of it might take place behind closed doors, but also in a great many of these kinds of fact patterns, portions of it take place not behind closed doors. There's a paper trail, there's contracts, there's NDAs, there's, uh, you know, what in the legal profession we call a prompt outcry witnesses, people who were told immediately afterwards, which is not ironclad, but if you have a preponderance of them and they're saying something consistently and there was a kind of passionate prompt outcry before someone had time to come up with a story, that does carry extra weight in a courtroom. I didn't see why it shouldn't in a repertorial context as well. All of these tools need to be pieced together with great care. But the fundamental principle of the arguments I made at the time for a long while to no avail, I think was true and has been emulated mostly in a way that I find positive. To the question of when I knew I was onto something, you know, that's very disconnected from this separate and yes, gratifying component of, you know, sometimes you do a story uh, or some uh, number of stories and, and there is activism that springs up around it and there's political and, and legislative change that springs up around it or even cultural change. Um, that's, that's wonderful to see as a reporter who cares about the issues you're, you're digging into, obviously. But it, it was very much not the project behind the stories. Um, I think, you know, part of what we all assess going back to this question of story selection is, is this an underserved beat? Is this something I can contribute to uh, in, a, in a way that is needed, partly because there's not enough of it happening? And it was clear to me that this had that quality, that it was going to tap into a reservoir of untold stories. Um, but, it, but it wasn't like uh, an act of activism on my part. And I draw that distinction a lot. You know, I, because that became uh, a cause championed by activists I really admire, and that was an instrumental part of the social change around it, uh, I get sort of conflated into that. Uh, but, but actually, the fact that I did a series of stories about violent sexual crime uh, that did attract that audience and that interest from activists had very little to do with the follow-on movement. So I wasn't knowing that I was onto something in the sense of like uh, finally feeling I had, I had cracked into, you know, op opening up this, this font of, of activism. It, it was... I think a separate series of realizations, the first of which was very granular, which is uh, when I was working on the Harvey Weinstein story, for instance, I had gone through uh, a really grueling process, which I, I you know, wrote about and has all become public now, of just being told repeatedly, like, you have to stop, uh, you know, this isn't a story, this will never be a story, no one's gonna care about this, but then also much more nakedly, like, the, the corporation backing me at the time saying, you know, you, you need to stop because this, this is causing trouble. Uh, and I was very fortunate that I had a working level producer, a wonderful journalist named Rich McHugh, um, who was, you know, by my side for a lot of that early reporting and who, you know, walked over that essentially and became a whistleblower and it made it much harder to obfuscate that that had happened. Uh, but it was still a, a very grueling fight and I, I think, um, in that process, 
from kind of the beginning, it was apparent that that was a consequential story in which people were getting hurt and there was an urgent moral imperative to stay on it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it made the, the subsequent journey of a lot of gaslighting and a lot of wading through corporate obstacles much more punishing because it wasn't like, you know, I'm not saying I had a critical mass of a complete story from, from day one, but you know as a reporter when it's a story. And, and you also often know pretty early when it's a story that is going to be borne out with reportable leads. And that was all in place very early and was apparent to any kind of independent journalist that cast eyes on it, uh, you know, which then made it a, a very long, difficult process of, of wading through all of these obstacles.